in the lecture outline. This is page E20. You'll notice at the bottom of E20, it shows how the spinal cord passes through the vertebral column. And you'll notice that there are these spinal nerves coming off the spinal cord. Spinal cord passes through the vertebral column, uh, and these spinal nerves exit through holes or openings between the vertebrae. These holes or openings between the vertebrae are called intervertebral foramen. What does inter mean? Between. between. So there are foramen or holes between the vertebrae. And uh, here I have a model of the vertebral column uh, with the spinal nerves coming out. And you can see these yellow spinal nerves coming out through holes between the vertebrae, through the intervertebral foramen. It's also shown on uh, some of these skeleton guys where they have the yellow nerves coming out uh, from, uh, from, uh, through these openings between the vertebrae. <clears throat> Since we're on this picture, uh, I mentioned uh, right up here the intervertebral foramina, these holes. Uh, since we're on this picture, surrounding our spinal cord and our brain are three membranes. These three membranes are known as the three meninges. Now, how you have heard that word meninges, you say, I never heard of it. You've heard of spinal meningitis. Meningitis is an infection of the meninges. So uh, there are three membranes that surround and protect the spinal cord and also the brain. Now, the uh, outermost membrane is called the dura matter. The word dura matter literally means tough mother. Dura, like durable, tough, and mater is Latin for mother. That's a tough mother. And we've already mentioned back on <coughs> section D12, when we were learning histology, that the dura matter is made up of that regularly arranged dense fibrous connective tissue, the same tissue that's real tough, just like a tendon. And it's to protect the uh, brain and spinal cord. Uh, and the context that you've heard that term dura matter, so I've never heard of it, is you've heard if they give local anesthetic, they give an injection of a local anesthetic just outside the dura matter. This space or area right outside the dura matter is called the epidural space, and this is known as an epidural block. So that's when they give the local anesthetic, really it's lidocaine, in this case not to numb the mouth, but to create numbness in the lower part of the spinal cord. So that's commonly done during childbirth. So that's called an epidural. We'll have more to say about that at another time. The next membrane, the middle membrane, is called the arachnoid membrane. The word arachnoid means like a spider web. Uh, there was a movie many years ago called Arachnophobia, Fear of Spiders. Uh, and then the innermost membrane, very soft membrane, that adheres to the surface of the spinal cord and brain called the pia matter. Pia is actually means soft in Latin. So the soft mother. Uh, now there is an important space between the arachnoid membrane and the pia matter, and that space between the arachnoid and the pia matter is called the subarachnoid space, because it's below the arachnoid. And what flows through the subarachnoid space is a fluid called cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF. So cerebrospinal fluid is flowing right in this space, the subarachnoid space, between the arachnoid membrane and the pia matter. On E21, so we have the, this vertebral column, and it's made up of vertebrae, and we divide the vertebrae into regions. And we talk about the cervical vertebrae, the word cervical means neck region, thoracic vertebrae, thoracic means chest, Lumbar, which means lower back, sacral, the sacral vertebrae, and the coccygeal are the tail vertebrae. So neck, chest, lower back, sacral, and tail. Uh, now, the, uh, there are seven cervical, 12 thoracic, five lumbar, five sacral, and four coccygeal in an embryo. But what happens during embryonic development is that in two of these cases, they fuse together. 
So as an adult, we still have seven cervical vertebrae, we still have 12 thoracic, we still have five lumbar, but the five sacral vertebrae uh, fuse together to form, to form one large sacrum. So the sacrum is this really big, large, lower vertebra at the back of the pelvis. It's called the sacrum, and it's really, it's a big one. It's actually formed by five vertebrae that fuse together. And the four coccygeal or tail vertebrae fuse together to form one tailbone or coccyx bone. You, if you're wondering, well, do we have to know that? Of course you do. Uh, here, just for comparison, and you don't need to know it, is a cat. And a cat is similar. The big difference is it's got a lot of tail vertebrae because they have long tails and we don't. On the thoracic vertebrae, the, the vertebrae of the chest, Attached to each of the 12 thoracic vertebrae is a pair of ribs. So since we have 12 thoracic vertebrae, we have 12 pairs of ribs. You might say, well, what about uh, men? 12 pairs of ribs. You say, what about women? 12 pairs of ribs. You'd say, well, didn't Adam get the, you know, the rib took take it away from him? Uh, if you know Hebrew, it doesn't use the word rib. It means side of the body. Eve was taken from the side of his body, meaning they're both equals. He wasn't taken from his head, she's not better than him, wasn't taken from his foot, she's, uh, he's not better than her, they were equals. That's what it's, that's the learning from that. It has nothing to do with that one last rib, all right? We, we, you read Bible to, to, to learn how to behave and treat one another, not to learn anatomy lessons or geology lessons or chemistry. All right, that's there to teach you how to treat one another. So we have to ask what that's supposed to teach you. If you take it from the side, you're an equal. Incidentally, in the picture on the top right on E21, so it shows two vertebrae, and they're kind of stacked onto one another. And uh, what is between them is uh, the intervertebral disc that the intervertebral discs are made up of a tissue called fibrocartilage, which is uh, the second hardest tissue in the body. The only tissue harder than uh, uh, cartilage, uh, fibrocartilage is bone. So uh, that forms these discs. And we'll be learning more about the discs later. On the left-hand side, I, I talk about the discs. Uh, we're going to save this stuff on discs for when we get to section uh, G, uh, which will be for our second exam. So we're just going to skip that part right now. Let's talk about the basic structure of a vertebra by going back to E20. So back on page E20 at the very top, what is the basic structure of a vertebra? Now I'm going to describe it. Uh, we do have models that you can look at. This model will be at the back of the room. This is showing a vertebra here. It's showing the spinal cord passing through the vertebra. And we have, of course, loose vertebrae that we can look at that are in the drawer. And we also have uh, vertebrae that are kind of strung together. The basic structure of a vertebra looks like this. This is called the body of the vertebra. And the body is on the facing the ventral or anterior, which means the front side. Here on the anterior, the front, uh, ventral side, the belly side, th these are for the body of the vertebrae. On the back, sticking out on the back, is the spinous process. And that's, we can all feel that. If we feel our back side, you'll feel these spines sticking out. Those are called the spinous processes of the vertebrae, and that's on the dorsal or posterior side. The opening in each vertebra is called the vertebral foramen or neural foramen, and of course what's passing through it is the spinal cord. And that's exactly what we saw in the picture at the bottom of how the spinal cord passes through uh, the vertebral foramen. You'll notice that Surrounding the vertebral foramen is an arch of bone, an arch of bone known as the vertebral or neural arch. And they divide that vertebral arch into different sections. Now, I don't think that what I'm about to say is the most important information. It would be good to know, but there's some things that are certainly more important to know than others. So the way they divide this arch 
uh, is the following. At the very base of the arch are called the pedicles. The word ped means foot. The more you put your feet on a car, with the, right, they call it an accelerator pedal and a brake pedal because that's where your feet go. Pedal means the foot, the base. And then after the ped, uh, pedicle comes the transverse processes. Now the word transverse means horizontal. So you will see that there are these transverse processes sticking out horizontally to the sides. So that comes next. And then there is a flat area, a flat area right here and here called the lamina. The word lamina means flat. And then finally, there is that spinous <laughs> process. So in other words, the lamina are on both sides of the spinous process. All right, so let me explain what a laminectomy is. And the word that I'm saying is this. What does tome or tomi mean? To cut. to cut, as in this course called anatomy. So literally, tomi of the lamina, to cut the lamina. So here's the question. If they wanted to access, to reach, the, if they had to do surgery on the spinal cord, if you're trying to reach the spinal cord, are, are you, is it easier to access it going through the entire belly, uh, the, the drilling through the body of the vertebra, or would it be easier to go from the backside? Back. Obviously the backside. So the spinal cord is running inside the vertebral column. So how did they get to the spinal cord if somebody needs in, uh, surgery on their spinal cord? So what they're going to do is cut the lamina. They cut the lamina on both sides, and they literally pull away the spinous process. And that exposes the spinal cord. If I were to draw a picture to show that, so they would simply pull this spinous process. They have cut the lamina right here. They move that away. That allows them to access the spinal cord. And when they've uh, done the surgery, then they just return this cut section. They return it right here, they would wire it into place, <clears throat> and it would literally grow back together again. And if you're wondering, well, how could it grow back together again? Well, anybody who's broken an arm bone or a leg bone, does it grow back together? It does. A real living bone is, in fact, alive. It's got living cells in it. On uh, page E21, what we now want to talk about is how, now that we've talked about the basic structure of a vertebra, how do cervical vertebra differ from thoracic, differ from lumbar, differ from sacral and coccygeal? How do you recognize the different vertebrae of the different regions? So there are a number of unique characteristics of cervical vertebrae, but I think the one characteristic I'd like to draw your attention to is right here. Only cervical vertebrae have a hole in the transverse process going horizontally. So only the cervical vertebrae have the transverse foramen. <clears throat> None of the other vertebrae do. There's other features as well. Typically, the spinous process is bifid. It's bifurcated. It's not straight. But I think the single best characteristic to use, and you only need to use one, is that transverse foramen. So then the question is, well, what's the transverse foramen? What's that hole for? And as I wrote here, the transverse foramen are the openings through which the so-called vertebral arteries uh, travel up the uh, vertebral column and then pass through the, uh, the foramen magnum into the skull. If you uh, look on this model right here, I think some of you can see a red, red wires. These represent vertebral arteries that are traveling up uh, the cervical vertebrae and then go into the skull to supply oxygenated blood. We have a picture that you can look at. Uh, it's on page uh, E17. We wrote that here, right, on E17. So looking at page E17, which we've done previously, in our bottom picture on E17, uh, previously we had spoken of the internal carotid artery that enters through the carotid canal comes up through the foramen last serum and brings oxygenated blood to the brain, you'll notice there's another artery shown here. Running right here, it's labeled VA, VA, which does not stand for Veterans Administration. It stands for the vertebral artery, the vertebral artery. 
and it travels right through these uh, holes called the transverse foramina of the cervical vertebrae and then passes through the foramen nagdum, the big hole at the base of the skull, and also carries oxygenated blood to the brain. So in fact, uh, there are two pairs of arteries bringing oxygenated blood to your brain. There's a right and left internal carotid artery and a right and left vertebral artery. Four arteries are bringing oxygenated blood to your brain. Now, again, you might say, like, do I have to know that? Is that even important? No. It's only important if you think the brain is important. <laughs> well, if you're not sure whether the brain is important, the brain is the most important structure or organ in the entire body. Because, in fact, when your brain dies, you, you, can, you're, you're, you can be pronounced brain dead, and that's it. It doesn't matter if your heart is still beating. It doesn't matter if your kidneys are still working. You're a vegetable. So, yes, that's really important. Okay, uh, uh, now there are seven cervical vertebrae. They all are all, all, are all characterized by having the transverse foramen uh, in the transverse processes. There are three cervical, three of the seven uh, cervical vertebrae that are especially noteworthy that I want to draw your attention to. The very top first cervical vertebra has a name called the atlas, which I've mentioned to you previously. Just like this big giant carried the weight of the earth on his shoulders, the very top cervical vertebrae of the neck holds up the skull. Uh, it, the atlas uh, is also very unique looking. There is no other vertebra that looks like it. Now, I, uh, let's see if I can enlarge this here. I drew this magnificent picture. Now, if this picture right here represents a typical cervical vertebra, you'd say, what is that? It's supposed to look like this, all right? So here it is. So what does the atlas look like? The atlas is very unique looking. It, it does not have a body. Can you see where I've removed the body? And it doesn't have the spinous process. So I've removed the spinous process. This is what the atlas looks like. Can you visualize that? There's no other vertebra that is missing the body and the spinous process. Now, you've got a picture of it on E22. On E22. So this is the atlas. It still has the transverse foramen for the uh, passage of the vertebral artery. Now you might say, you got this picture in color? Yes, of course, it's in your lab manual. Here uh, in figure uh, 9.13, 9 9 this is the atlas vertebra. All right, so you can see it has no body, it has no spinous process. So it's got, you've got pictures in your lab manual of all this stuff. Uh, another cervical vertebra that you need to recognize, and if you're wondering, why, like, what do I mean by that? What I mean is, I may put a loose atlas out on the test and ask you, identify this vertebra, be specific. And you need to identify it as either C1 or the atlas. Another one that is unique is the second cervical vertebrae, C2, that is are referred to as the axis. So, how is the axis different? Uh, well, if the atlas was missing stuff, the second cervical vertebra has extra stuff. What does it have extra? It has this additional process sticking straight up, and it's shown right here. This process is sticking straight up is called the DENS, or odontoid process. Either term odontoid process, or DENS is an easier word to spell, uh, you can call it that. There is no other vertebra that has this additional part. So uh, the C2 or axis looks like a normal cervical vertebra, except it's got something extra. Now it's kind of interesting that if the atlas is missing stuff and the axis, the C2, has extra stuff, how did that come to be? Actually, embryologically, the body of the atlas separated from the atlas, and it actually reattached to the axis right below it, forming the dens. So that's literally how embryologically it formed. It migrated from the, uh, from the body of the atlas to and became the dens of the axis. Now, th there's one more cervical vertebra I want you to know about, 
Uh, you don't have to uh, recognize it uh, you know, loose, but you just need to know about it. And that's the seventh cervical vertebra. So we've spoken of this uh, way at the beginning of the course. If you feel the back of your neck, you will feel a bump or spine towards the lower part of the, your neck. That is the spinous process of the seventh cervical vertebra, or C7, sometimes known as vertebra prominence. It's prominent. That is used as an anatomical landmark. That's what I wrote, an anatomical landmark and we pointed out that once you feel that bump, if you count two spines below it, that's the top of your heart from the back side. So uh, the top of the heart is at the level of T2, the second thoracic. So you could feel C7, two spines below that is T2. All right, we now know how to recognize cervical vertebrae. How about thoracic vertebrae? So thoracic vertebrae have a, a couple of characteristics. Uh, the, I think the easiest characteristic to focus on is looking at the spinous process. You'll notice that the spinous process of at least most of the thoracic vertebrae, if not all, at least most, is that it tends to be very long and it points downward. So if I were going to test you on a loose thoracic vertebra on a lab test, I would choose one of these very characteristic thoracic vertebrae that has a very long, narrow, downward pointing spinous process. Now, in addition, the thoracic vertebrae uh, actually have some additional facets where the ribs attach. And how many thoracic vertebrae are there? Twelve. So you have how many pairs of ribs? Twelve. One pair of ribs attached to each of the thoracic vertebrae. So we have twelve thoracic vertebrae, we have twelve pairs of ribs. All right, so now we know how to recognize a thoracic vertebrae. How do we recognize a lumbar vertebra? So I wrote that the lumbar vertebrae are characterized by short, blunt spinous processes and very large, massive bodies. If we go back to E20, back on page E20, uh, right in the middle of the page, this is a characteristic lumbar vertebra. <coughs> Got a, looking at this side view or lateral view, it's got a big, heavy body, and it's got a short, blunt spinous process. Very heavy vertebra. So if I put that out as a loose vertebra, I would choose a really good example of a big, heavy uh, 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 lumbar vertebra uh, for you to identify as coming from the lumbar region. <clears throat> and then uh, back where we were on E22, so the sacrum. The sacrum, uh, we know, is uh, this huge vertebra. This is a loose sacrum. Uh, and it is really very large because it's formed from the fusion of five sacral vertebrae that fuse together during embryologic development. And the sacrum uh, actually forms the very back of the pelvis here. Uh, so you can see where on the back side, this is the large sacrum vertebra on the back side of the pelvis. Uh, on page uh, E23, on E23, uh, we know that ligaments hold bones together. There are various ligaments that hold the, verte the vertebrae of the vertebral column together. Uh, don't worry about learning these names. Don't worry about that. You have enough to worry about. Uh, this shows a side view of the vertebral column. This is the spinous processes sticking out on the back or posterior or dorsal side. These are the bodies of the vertebrae on the ventral or anterior side. These are the holes or openings through which the spinal nerves come out called the intervertebral foramen. Again, you can see that right here which the spinal nerves are coming out through these openings called intervertebral foramen. Uh, and the main thing I want to draw your attention to is the characteristic curvatures of the vertebral column. You'll notice that in the cervical or neck area, it's caved in on the back side. So being caved in, it, we use the term concave, like caved in uh, on the uh, back in the cervical area. That's what's normal. 
You'll notice that in the thoracic region, the chest region, it sticks out. So when it sticks out, we say it's convex, at least on the back side. And then in the lower back, the lumbar, again, it's caved in on the back side, concave. And then finally, the sacrum sticks out. It's convex in the sacral area. Those are the normal curvatures of the vertebral column. How did they form? How did that happen? Well, I think the easiest way to explain this is developmentally. When you look at a newborn infant, it still basically tends to spend its time in the so-called fetal position with its legs tucked up under its tummy. And its entire vertebral column on the back side sticks out. The whole thing is convex uh, in the, uh, of that newborn. Uh, around three months, around two and a half, three months of age, this kid's going to start to lift his head. Now, the head is about one-fourth, one-fifth of his entire body, so it weighs quite a bit. And as he starts to lift his head up, off the pillow, off the, uh, the mattress, holding up the weight of the head puts a strain on the vertebral column that causes it to permanently become bent uh, so that on the back side, it's caved in in the cervical or neck area just to help hold up the weight of that heavy head. Uh, now later, this kid is going to uh, crawl around and at around, uh, Oh, approaching uh, a one year of age and so on, approaching a one year, he's going to crawl and one day he's going to pull himself up onto a chair or a coffee table. He's going to pull himself up and stand as he gets ready to walk. So now the weight of his whole body as he's standing upright, holding on initially, is uh, bearing down on that vertebral column and to stand up, the lumbar area, the lower back vertebrae, cave in or bend in uh, 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 on the posteriorly in the lumbar area. So that lumbar curvature was created by standing up. So you'll notice that the, the two curvatures where it's caved in are the cervical and the lumbar. And those came secondarily, secondarily to lifting the head up and then standing up. So that's why we've written that the original primary curvature, the original primary curvature was convex. <clears throat> and uh, secondarily to holding the head up, the cervical curvature caved in, and the, then standing up, the lumbar curvature caved in. So th that's why we also say that the thoracic and sacral are part of that original curvature, the original primary curvature. That's what we wrote here. So the original primary curvature, which is convex, includes the thoracic and sacral. And so that the, the fact that they stick out is part of the original uh, primary curvature, and the fact that the cervical and lumbar are caved in are secondary to uh, lifting the head up and standing up. On page uh, E24, on E24, there are abnormal curvatures. Now, in fact, all of us, all of us have abnormal curvatures of our spine, of our vertebral column. The only people who don't have any abnormality to the vertebral column are professional models because they don't do what all of you are doing. Right, slouch, that's right. Because the moment they start slouching on a regular basis, their spine is no longer straight, and that's what they want for models. So that's, a, you know, your parents told you, right, you're supposed to sit up straight. But we all know we don't sit up straight, we don't stand up straight, we slouch, we lean, and therefore, because we tend to do this all the time, our spines become bent in all different ways. All right, we all do it. But we're not going to be professional models because our spine is not, is not straight. If you ever see somebody who sits up straight, they could be your same height, but they will sit much taller than, in that chair than you do. Is that right? Because we all slouch. And it really takes effort to sit up properly. 
So they have to do that all the time, as well as weigh 67 pounds or something. But, um, so uh, what are the common curvatures? And obviously, some people have these ex in extreme ways uh, more, more than just our usual slight uh, abnormal curvatures. A very common abnormal curvature is scoliosis. Uh, this is a lateral curvature where the spine is bent to the sides because of slouching. But again, it can be really extreme where people have various degenerative diseases of the skeletal system. Uh, they may have nutritional deficiencies in calcium. And so uh, they develop uh, uh, weak bones and tend to develop uh, scoliosis. Uh, this is shown also right here. Uh, another abnormal curvature is kyphosis or hunchback. This is an exaggerated thoracic curvature, and it's shown uh, here. Uh, where I tend to see kyphosis is in elderly people who suffer from osteoporosis, weakening of their bones, and they're haunched over like this as they walk. If you've seen that, so they've got kyphosis. And uh, a third abnormal curvature is lordosis or swayback. This is an exaggerated lumbar curvature right here. And uh, this, again, exists in a lot of people, but it's especially prominent lordosis in women. And why is it especially common in women? Wearing high-heeled shoes. Because when you wear high-heeled shoes, the whole purpose of the high-heeled shoes is to exaggerate that lumbar curvature and make the sacrum stick out. That's the whole point of it. But obviously, if you do that all the time, the whole lower back becomes has this exaggerated lumbar and sacral curvature, creating lordosis. Uh, because obviously, wearing high-heeled shoes, you're always walking downhill. Uh, and uh, that affects the way the spine uh, looks. All right, so you should be familiar with this. Uh, what's listed next on E24 is the rib cage. There's, of course, 12 pairs of ribs that are attached correspondingly to the 12 thoracic vertebrae. Uh, the, uh, the, we su further subdivide the uh, ribs into uh, the first through seventh are called the vertebral sternal ribs. And that's because these ribs go from the vertebral column directly to the sternum, directly to the sternum. First through seventh. Now the eighth, ninth, and tenth are called the vertebral chondral ribs because these are here and they actually attach to the cartilage of the seventh pair of ribs. So these ribs down here are attaching to the cartilage of the seventh. They don't go directly to the sternum. They're called vertebral chondral. And then uh, finally the eleventh and twelfth pair of ribs don't attach at all to the front. These are shown right here, right? These ribs right here, if you could make them out. These are uh, called the just vertebral ribs, not vertebral sternal, not vertebral chondral, just vertebral. They don't attach to the front at all. Sometimes they're called floating ribs. Floating ribs, that's the 11th and 12th pair. I might just also mention that this space between the ribs is called the inter costal space. Another word for rib is costal, C-O-S-T-A-L. We'll see that written in a moment. And uh, so inter means between. So intercostal means between the ribs. And that's a, an important area because if you're listening to the lungs and so on, you will listen in the intercostal space where you position the leads for a measure an electrocardiogram recording. Uh, is in the intercostal spaces of the uh, ribs. Uh, on page E25, on E25, it shows how the ribs attach to the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, they, there's the so-called head of the rib, and uh, the, the neck, and the tubercle, and they actually attach to what's called a little facet, or flat spot, on the sides of the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, on uh, E25, uh, here's where I mentioned the in word intercostal spaces, and the, uh, what's found in those spaces are muscles called intercostal muscles. The sternum, the sternum or breastbone is actually formed, the sternum is actually formed from three bones that fuse together during embryologic development. 
There's the upper manubrium, the middle body of the sternum, and the lower xiphoid process. And uh, these are listed on page E25. Uh, the manubrium is the superior or upper part. It, it articulates, that means it attaches to the clavicles. And here you can see these are the clavicles and the end that of the clavicle that attaches to the manubrium of the sternum is called the sternal end of the clavicle. This opposite end of the clavicle is called the acromial end, which attaches to the acromion process of the scapula. The sternal notch is this notch right here at the top of the manubrium. Uh, you can feel it yourself. Go ahead and feel that notch right at the very top of your sternum. Right? That's a kind of a little notch there. Um, on page E26, the middle part of the sternum is called the body of the sternum. And then we mentioned the sternal angle or sternal angle of Lewis. And we've learned this before. Uh, this is another anatomic landmark. If you palpate, if you feel the front of your sternum, you'll feel a little bump or ridge. That's called the sternal angle or sternal angle of Lewis, that little ridge. That's where the manubrium meets the body of the sternum. Just lateral, just to the sides of that ridge, is the second pair of ribs. And you can feel that. Feel the ribs just lateral to this, that ridge. That's the second pair of ribs, and that's where the top of your heart is. The top of your heart is at the level of the second pair of ribs. So that we use that as an anatomic landmark to very quickly locate the top of your heart. The uh, xiphoid process is the name for the lower part of the sternum. The lower part of the sternum down here is called the xiphoid process of the sternum. Three parts.